All right. So um, I think we've all, I think we all just agreed that there was, there's some old style of Mormon apologetics that has to do with that homonym that has to do with giving bad evidences like tapers for horses and, um, you know, redefining terms and, and sort of maybe shoddy scholarship or unproven scholarship. I mean, I think, I think that point has been sort of directly made in this podcast. What I started noticing as I saw Dan Peterson and, and Ralph Hancock and Lou Midgley and Greg Smith sort of, uh, sort of as I watched their decline, what I noticed is an ascent of a different form of apologetic. Um, and for me, that, that uh, would be por- sort of best characterized by what Richard Bushman does, what Terrell and Fiona Givens do, what, what Patrick, what I've heard uh, you do, which is, um, which is definitely not about uh, ad hominem attacks. It's definitely not so much about um, uh, trying to prove the church is true. It's definitely not based in, you know, focuses on anthropology or archaeology or Mesoamerican digs. But instead, um, it's it's a softer, it's more pastoral. It is, it's willing to say maybe mistakes have been made in a passive sense. It's... Um, it's going around to sort of these privately held um, seminars or firesides or people's homes to reach out to those who are doubting and questioning and to, to provide some sort of support, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, based more in the humanities or based more um, in, in soft and thoughtful and kind ways trying to still uh, encourage faith in the church, encourage devotion and active membership, but in just a new way. And so I, I was trying to search for a way to describe it. And the term that came to my mind was neo, new, new apologetics. And it, I, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback that people hate the term. Um, and so I, I totally want to hear why you or others may or may not like the term. But I just wanted to first set up the idea that there is definitely a new era of Mormon apologetics characterized by you, the Gibbons, the Bushmans, and others. It's happening. It's different. And so how would you label it or describe it, Patrick? Um, how would you describe it as different versus the same? And then if you do or don't like the term neo-apologetic, what's a way we can name it or label it to set it apart from what's been done in the past. Sure. No, that's that's a great setup, John. And and uh, I'm grateful for your um, generous appraisal and description of of the kind of work that that I've been doing. And you know, for for me, it's uh, it's it's kind of interesting because I uh, six years ago, as we said at the outset, I uh, assumed the the Howard W. Hunter Chair in, in Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University, and when I did that. Um, I had no intention of doing this kind of thing. I, w- I was very committed to uh, Mormon studies as a scholarly discipline that was in conversation primarily uh, uh, with other scholars in the academy, as much as uh, members of the church or others wanted to listen in on the conversations. That was great. But I was very committed to establishing the kind of uh, uh, traditional academic bona fides of uh, Mormon studies. It was a couple of years into that, uh, and, and that's where I would say that that's my day job. I mean, I, my, my day job is, is to do uh, traditional academic scholarship. Um, uh, I'm a historian by training, and so uh, and I continue to do that kind of work that I would say uh, lies far outside the realm of anything resembling uh, apologetics. I continue to, to publish things for the academy. But, but a couple of years into my uh, tenure as, as a hunter chair, I, I was approached to participate um, with the Bushmans in, as you said, going to, to private homes or firesides or other things to address some of these issues of what we now you know, call faith crisis, whether or not that's a great term, but that's that's the term that's stuck. And so I got sort of in, involved in it out of my own personal commitments. I'm a, I'm a believing and active member of the church. Uh, it's something that I find extremely meaningful in my life. Uh, and so I was, uh, I was happy to participate in that less 
in some ways as the hunter chair and more as as a member of the church, although I know that these professional and personal identities get mixed up together. Uh, and so out of those visits and travels and, and conversations with people, you know, my book Planted came out of that. And, and I think you're exactly right. I mean, the, the word you used was pastoral, and that's the word I use for myself uh, and, and for that book. I see it very much as a kind of conversational, pastoral, uh, in the sense of a kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation. What would I say to somebody if, if I sat down with them um, uh, over hot chocolate? And uh, what, would we, what would we talk about? I personally, whether by temperament or training, uh, I have basically zero interest in what I see as kind of tendentious scholarship. Um, even in the academy, you see people who build their careers arguing against other people. I've never been particularly interested in that kind of approach. Uh, I've always been more interested in making kind of positive arguments, maybe finding gaps or other things that have been left unsaid. And then is, is there a way that I can address that? So in my own approach, I've, I've never been particularly interested in critiquing anybody um, in particular uh, so much as having uh, these, these kinds of conversations. Now, along with that, as you said, comes a, a willingness for me to critique what I see as mistakes or problems in our past or even in, in the current church. I do not come out of this with the belief that the church as instantiated either in 1830 or 1857 or 2017 is perfect, that it, that it is an organization that perfectly represents the mind and will of God. I think the restoration is an ongoing process. And so as part of that, uh, uh, I think humility is a really important Christian virtue, and that includes being able to look at ourselves with a kind of self-critical lens and identify points in our history or even our current practice that I see as maybe not lining up with the ideals of science. So it is, you know, I was a little resistant uh, when, when I wrote Planted, is this a form of apologetics, again, because of the association with, a, with an older style and brand of it that I didn't, that I didn't myself uh, resonate with. Um, but is, is planted and is some of my other work, you know, my address at FAIR and other things, is that apologetics? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it begins from the presupposition that Mormonism is good and true and beautiful, uh, is worth defending, uh, is, a, is a life, and as Brian said, a worldview uh, worth inhabiting that has meaning and value in the modern world. Yes, absolutely. So it begins from that place and then makes arguments uh, from there. So in terms of whether neo-apologetics is a good term, I, I don't have a particular problem with it. I mean, would I, would I get a business card that says Patrick Mason, neo-apologist? <laughs> Probably not. Um, but am I offended by the term? No, not particularly. I don't care, you know, what, what you call us. You know, you can call us the Avengers or the Mickey Mouse Club or anything else. I mean, but you know, what, what I do is what I do. And, uh, and I try, I've tried to develop a certain kind of voice. And I think you're right. The, the kind of people that you mentioned, the Bushmans, the Givens, Adam Miller, these kinds of people, I do find as kindred spirits. We actually represent different places on the spectrum. Some of us are more conservative or liberal than others. Some of us are willing to be more or less critical of certain things and, and occupy a certain kind of voice. Um, but but I, I do think that's, that's my cadre of, of people um, in, in terms of our approach. Is there a better term than neo-apologist? I don't immediately have one. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not offended by that term in, in any sense. Uh, again, if you would have asked me three or four years ago, I probably would have said, no, that's not who I am or what I do. Um, I, I have not, I, I mean, uh, to be perfectly honest, I haven't sat around thinking about what am I doing or what's the yeah, category right. that right. I inhabit, right. you know, along with the givens and so forth. So, uh, so I don't have a particular problem with the term, especially as you described it in your opening. That's um, I would actually be pleased and honored to inhabit the kind of space that, that you described uh, in, uh, in the opening. One of our listeners wants to say third wave, third wave Mormon apologetics. <laughs> I mean, for, fine, we can call it that. I mean, I, I associate that with feminism and, and, and right. I think uh, third wave feminism uh, if we apply that term, we probably couldn't use it here because third wave feminism generally has to do with people from the global south, people of color, uh, women of color. That's not what you're getting uh, with, with the, the crowd you said. I mean, the, there are more female voices, uh, to be sure. Fiona Givens has been a really prominent voice, Rosalind Welch and, and a number of other people. Uh, but we're still woefully short in terms of a global uh, sensibility. I think we have global sensibilities, but not global representation and certainly not people of color. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so I've got like a thousand questions and I'm going to just, I'll just lay out as many as we can and you can give uh, whatever answers you're able to in the time remaining. And I really appreciate you guys coming on. Yeah. So, so the, one of the biggest problems people have with apologists is just this idea that they start with the assumption that the church is true and then seek to gather evidence to bolster that position. Some say that's just not a credible position. It's not, a, it's maybe not even an honest position. What would you say to that uh, critique of apologetics? Well, I think it uh, depends on your definition of what is credible. Um, so, and what your standard is. So would it be credible from the standards of the secular academy? The answer is no. Uh, and it's one reason, for instance, that uh, planted doesn't appear on my professional CV. Uh, I don't see it as uh, doing the kind of work that I do as a professional historian uh, with, with the same kind of methods uh, or standards. I think it's academically informed to be sure, and I'm able to apply some of the methods and training that I've received but, but I do start, and I'll, just, I'll only speak for myself, although I do think this would apply to the Givens' work, uh, I would say it applies less so to Richard Bushman's, uh, to, to Rough Stone Rolling. I think that falls more in line with the traditional academy uh, and is the, the, what we see on display there is a historian doing historical work. But, but for our more pastoral work, Absolutely. I begin, I mean, just look at the opening pages of Planted. I mean, I bear my testimony in my own way uh, and, and talk about that, that I think Mormonism is, is a meaningful and true uh, uh, religion that I participate in. And so, uh, so I do begin from that. I begin from that kind of experience. I begin from those sets of assumptions that I've made, partly rationally informed, but largely just from my own personal experience. And then I make arguments from there. So I think I'd be dishonest if I would say that I was just starting out from ground zero and then built a bunch of evidence and then, oh, wait, uh, I've discovered Mormonism is the true religion. <laughs> that's right. not, certainly that's not what's happened for me. I began out of my experience with Mormonism and then uh, uh, made arguments, pastoral arguments primarily, some intellectual and rational arguments based on that. I think I think the reason I think this question comes from the place of people who are really struggling to determine if the church really is what it claims to be, because if it is, it's worth obeying with absoluteness. But if it isn't, there's a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of decisions in life that would be very different. And so a lot of times people are looking for a neutral source, somebody that, can, that doesn't have a dog in the hunt that isn't biased trying to push them in one way or the other, that just wants to do their best to lay out the evidence and then let people make an informed, wise decision. And so I think sometimes when people struggle with apologists, it's just feeling like, no, I need help figuring out what's true. I don't want a spin or someone trying to push me in a direction based on their own biases. And I, and I know it's hard to do. It's yeah. hard yeah, to find Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who is who who would be perfectly neutral or what that would look like um you know we this is one of the the contributions of of postmodernism is is to to undermine this uh kind of modernist belief in objectivity uh and that we can start from a kind of value free neutral bias free position uh and so i do have uh values i have experiences i do have uh uh commitments uh, that line up with the institutional LDS church. I remain, you know, strongly affiliated with it. So am I a, a neutral source on this? No. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure who that would be or what that would look like. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody is truly neutral uh, in, no. in, in, the, in the world. No, I think, I think postmodernism makes a fair point. And at the same time, if it's, if it's difficult or impossible to find someone who's truly neutral, the people you can definitely write off are the ones who start by admitting that they that they uh, have started with the conclusion that it's true, and then they're going to gather the evidence to bolster the claim. I mean, it just like you could you could probably write off anybody who says the church is evil and I want to destroy it and take it down. Yeah. Um, but but I, I guess you can see the spirit from which people would have concern. Oh, absolutely. About, no, I, I understand that, that yeah. position. Uh, and I understand the desire for a kind of neutral, fair and balanced uh, a, a approach where, where people don't have a dog in the fight. I just don't, I don't see it anywhere. I don't it's, see it in the academy. I don't see it in science. I don't see it in journalism. Right. I don't see it in politics. Everywhere, there's always a view from somewhere. 
Yeah, um, for and sure, so for I, sure. I do think we can, then this is what the Academy does is there are certain methodologies and standards that, that, that try to strip back uh, and limit uh, some of our own personal biases. This is what the scientific method uh, uh, tries to do. But even that is, you know, scientists have their own views, right? right. And, and so I do think there are ways that we can try to hold those things at arm's length. And, and in a lot of ways, I try to do that myself uh, in terms of having a kind of uh, critical approach. And in my, in my scholarship that isn't planted, I try to have a kind of critical distance and the tools that I've learned as a historian to be able to approach Mormonism with a critical lens. Uh, but but that's, that's different uh, than, than a pastoral sure. approach. Totally. Um, a, a next big set of questions are around why apologists are even needed. A lot of people want to say, you know, Abinadi and Moses didn't need apologists. They were prophets that were willing to speak publicly and defend themselves. Isn't that the whole point of having prophets is that they speak to God and tell us what's true? Why do they need PR departments and law firms and apologists to kind of speak for them? Um, apologists aren't sort of officially sanctioned. Uh, and in some ways, there's a perceived dishonesty that the church wants to have their cake and eat it too. They want to arm's length, put the apologists out there, have these secret, you know, firesides and, and retreats or workshops to support people. But at the same time, they don't want to ever officially endorse anything because then they're accountable for what's said. And so some just feel like apologists represent the, the church leaders just not standing up and owning their role and their authority, but instead trying to sort of in, in, in secretive or what some would say disingenuous ways, trying to slide that off, but not totally onto other people. Yeah, can I would you, say I'm not sure that, that... Can you see yeah, that? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure that I entirely understand the critique, and I'd say this on a couple of different levels. One is that I'm not sure what we mean by secret meetings. Um, I, I would say that the meetings that I and the Bushmans and Givens have had are no more secret than the meetings that you have uh, with, with your folks. Are they private in the sense that uh, you only have 100 people in the room rather than broadcasting to the entire world? Uh, maybe, although actually a lot of our meetings have been uh, live streamed. And so I'm not sure what the secret part of that would be. Um, the, uh, I mean, every, every time I've done one of these events, they're oh, just, open uh, and announced. And, and anybody, so. anybody's a, anybody is able to attend if, if they live in the area. Okay. I, I think some the perception of secrecy is around this idea that when the church published its essays, it didn't want to let everyone know about them. It just wanted them to be available quietly for okay. people who had questions. Okay. Well, that, I think that's a different, I think that's a different claim. And, and I think that's, that's a fair enough, um, uh, a concern and, and even critique and, it, and it's even one that I resonate with to a certain degree. On the other hand, I sympathize with the, uh, with the burden of managing and administering a worldwide church. And they were, uh, and, and I was privy to some of these conversations where, where they were concerned with, uh, there, there were different views. Uh, some people wanted to put it on the front page of LDS.org so that everybody saw it. Other people said, we don't want to provoke, uh, uh, questions and faith crises and people who don't have those kinds of questions, right? People, with, you know, I mean, think about a, a 12 year old kid or, or, you know, somebody like that, who, a, a brand new convert, right? Let's give them time to develop in the faith before they are able to address these more. And, and I think those are reasonable debates to have. It's not about secrecy. They weren't behind some kind of firewall. They were open to the public. It was on the internet. You had to find it to be sure. And that's one of the critiques I have is they're still, uh, hard to find unless you know what you're looking for. And so I think too few members of the church know they're there, but I, 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 I wouldn't, uh, I personally wouldn't think of them as being secret I uh, think, in any sense. So I think the fact that, that, that recordings have been historically prohibited for a lot of these events and the fact that in, instead of having firesides, why shouldn't these things be openly discussed at general conference or sure. in every Sunday school? I think that's, where some of the concerns about no secrecy. understood that, that, yeah. that's that's where I'm glad that we're inching <laughs> towards uh, that direction and some of these things are being built into the curriculum for seminary for Sunday school it we again we can debate about the pace of change uh, and even some of the tone and approach on these but I'm I'm gratified that, that we're seeing some progress on that front again some of us wish the progress was 
uh, was a little bit faster. faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Patrick, um, we'll keep you. We want to keep Patrick as long as we can, but it's now eleven thirty, which is the number you gave us. So you, yeah, so you how, lock how, out. How about we, you know? Yeah, I do have a, a flight to catch, but maybe five more minutes, John. If, if, okay. if there's any pressing questions. So just and this idea, Brian, why? Can, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so why why do prophets need apologists? Why does the church need apologists at all? Why yeah, can't they well, speak for themselves? You know. Well, I think that's a fair question, um, but I don't think any uh, prophet has ever been a, a one-man show. I mean, Jesus had his apostles in the 70s and disciples who went out. Uh, Paul was, was an apologist, uh, made uh, rationalist defenses of the Christianity that he received. And so this is, um, I don't think this is new to Mormonism or unique to contemporary Mormonism. Uh, even in an era of 21st technologies, uh, prophets and apostles uh, can only be in so many places at once. And I think there is a difference uh, in um, calling and approach. Uh, I, I think uh, prophets and apostles are generally called, and, and this we can nuance this, but I think they're called to declare what they see as, as the word and will of God. Uh, whereas then it's left to others to take that theology or that deposit of faith and then start to do the kind of rational work uh, to systematize it, to make sense of it. Uh, and uh, I think this is part of the vo vocational calling of any person of faith is to make sense of what one receives uh, from religious authorities or from scripture and then reconcile it with whatever they find, uh, whatever their position in the world is. So whether you live in, in medieval Europe or 21st century America, uh, there has to be a way to, to reconcile the teachings of the faith and to make them modern, to make them relevant. And I think that's the responsibility of every person of faith, not just a special elite class of apologists and not just an elite class of religious authorities. Right. But can you, can you get the sense, can you, can you understand the question that there's a, a wish that, that if the brethren speak to God, if they really are, God's uh, servants, and and I think they want. They, it seems like they want to perpetuate that impression that they have direct lines of communication. Can you understand the concern or the wish that they would be able to more speak directly uh, to some of these issues that are literally, you know, causing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people to leave what they believe is the true church? Yeah. Why why couldn't they more effectively and forcefully? speak for God or for themselves directly? Sure. Well, well, I, I would, uh, to, to some degree, I would share that wish that there have been times in the past decade or so where I, I personally would wish that uh, we would see more of the kind of um, apostolic responsibility for public teaching and, and not just in carefully scripted uh, uh, moments like general conference, uh, which are also kind of short form, you know, how much can you say in 15 or 20 minutes? Uh, and so, so at, at times I do wish we heard a little bit more directly from the apostles and maybe a little bit less from the, the Mormon newsroom, although I appreciate actually they've done a lot of really important and strong work over the years as well. I mean, look, it's a, it's a big, huge multinational organization and, uh, and, and so it, it's going to take on some of the characteristics of a big, right. huge multinational organization. I don't resent that, even if, even if it's sometimes I had kind of primitivist impulses for, a, you know, a purer kingdom of God or something like that. But, it, but, in, but I, I have to settle with living in a modern bureaucratized sure. world. Sure. But, 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 I, but I do, even if we were to, to have a kind of very strong view of, of prophets and apostles, a very kind of hyper-Orthodox view of, of them speaking the mind and will of the Lord and having a, a direct communication with them. I still don't think that rules out the uh, responsibility and availability of rational defenses or pastoral defenses to be made by members of the church. It's built into Mormon theology that we think everybody should be a prophet to, right. to one respect or another. Uh, we think everybody has that kind of uh, access to God. And so we don't believe it's, it's uh, simply the preserve of a certain ecclesiastical elite. Love it. Thank you. Uh, another, another concern that people uh, express about, I'll just talk about neo-apologetics specifically, and it ties to this thing about postmodernism. I attended that 
uh, that day long seminar on on translation at Utah State mm-hmm. University recently. I think I think one of the the things I noticed at that um, at that Utah State University seminar on uh, translation with Rosalind Welch and and Phil, Phil Barlow and Richard Bushman and Terrell Givens and others, it seems like the neapologetic approach is to sometimes want to redefine words to the point that they're meaningless. Like, what, is, what does translation really mean? I think we all have a sense for what Joseph meant when he said translate. And yet, because now all the evidence makes, makes it really appear like it's not a translation, it, we're going we're gonna to spend a full day trying to redefine the word translation. And it's not just that, but it's this idea of defining down expectations. Let's define down what scripture means, define down what prophets mean, define down what revelations mean. And it just sort of weak, weaken uh, the bold claims of Mormonism uh, to, the, to the point where for many people, uh, not, no, number one, it's a different church. The church of neo-apologetics is very different than the church at General Conference. And, you know, that, that's very confusing for people. But also, it just starts to water everything down and finesse everything and nuance everything to the point where it just feels strained and, and weak and kind of um, unmormon. Mm. I, don't, I don't mean to be mean. I hope, you, I hope you know that these are genuine concerns people have. And I hope you can know that there's a spirit of love in this because they don't want to see Mormonism neutered or weakened. And they're frustrated with the official narrative versus all these nuanced liberal narratives that are post-Mormon and, and in some ways uh, feels like the philosophy of men mingled with scripture, literally, instead of, you know, bold doctrine that we can stand behind. So I, I, that's a lot. I, I don't expect it. To no, sure. Well, well I, I, I think that would be a good fodder for an essay in The Interpreter, John. This is now where you have uh, <laughs> uh, squared the circle here because there, there was recently an essay in The Interpreter, which is a publication uh, of, of Dan Peterson and a lot of those old farms people that recently has leveled those exact same claims against me, Grant Hardy, the Givenses, and other people that, that we might. So, so you are now a, a subscriber to The Interpreter and a contributing <laughs> editor. So congratulations, John. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, but, but, but those are, th- these are serious questions. And, uh, and, and, and I accept them in the, in the spirit in, in which they're given. So ab- absolutely. And, and I will say that when I was going around with uh, Richard Bushman and Claudia Bushman doing uh, some of these uh, seminars, uh, which we didn't think were secret. Uh, we one of the things that that Richard oftentimes said to the group uh, and to me personally is he says my biggest fear as we do this, as we as we look critically at our history, as we as we are self reflective about some of the bold claims that have been made, the kind of absolutist claims that have been made in Mormonism over the years, that as we take a more humble approach to these, he says my biggest fear is that in some, days, in some ways we water down the faith. In some ways we, we strip Mormonism of its power. And, and, and I think that is, so, 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 so this critique that you're making, John, and that other people have, uh, I certainly recognize it, Richard certainly recognizes it, that Mormonism's power uh, over the past two centuries has, lar- in, in many people's lives, has largely been drawn from its ability to make bold and audacious claims uh, that then people resonated with and then decided that they were willing to give everything for those claims, right? The same thing happened for early Christians, right? Read the New Testament. Jesus is not offering a kind of weak, watered-down liberal theology. I mean, those are bold claims, and, and people literally gave their lives, including Jesus himself, and Joseph himself gave his life for what he thought were bold and audacious claims. And so I think there is something to the critique. Uh, do the neo-apologists, or whatever we want to call it, are they engaging in something like liberal theology? Are they watering down the faith and stripping Mormonism of its power? That's a claim I take very, very seriously. My answer to it is, is personally, I don't think so. Uh, my own view is that Mormonism can be a big tent. I'm perfectly happy sitting next in, in Sunday school or in general conference sitting next to people 
uh, who in interpret some of these things in a much more conservative or what we would call ortho uh, orthodox uh, way. I think Mormonism is, and, and any robust ideology or system is big enough for internal debate, for multiple interpretations within it. I think that's a strength rather than a weakness. So I would actually, I think one of the problems of Mormonism historically is that it has set itself up. In some ways it adopted some of the tactics and language of fundamentalist Protestants and others who created such a black and white absolutist dualistic theology and culture that it became brittle. That if, if there was one part of it that started to, to get out of sync, then the whole thing seemed to fall apart or shatter. Uh, my own view is that theology is more supple, more flexible. Uh, we see through a glass darkly, right? Even though I believe that God can break through the veil and can re reveal things to the hearts and minds of women and men, um, I, I think our understanding of, of the cosmos is always going to be imperfect, right? Uh, and so, so I'm, I'm comfortable with a certain bit of ambiguity, a certain bit of flexibility, even while I sit next to people in Sunday school who are not. And different life experiences and trainings have led us to those different kinds of experiences. And, and I'm comfortable with that. I think that's, if Mormonism can't encompass the whole range of human experience from the absolutist to the more relativist, then I don't think it's a big enough religion that it claims to be. So, um, so I, I think my approach is not gonna be the approach of other people. Uh, but I also never want my approach to, in some ways, undermine uh, the faith of so somebody sitting next to me who, who does take more absolutist strain. So, so, uh, so I think people who have left the church sometimes have been raised on a more absolutist, dualistic version of Mormonism, that then when they encounter some of these things, it all falls apart. Uh, and I think what myself and the Givens and others are, are trying to do is to say there are other ways to inhabit uh, Mormonism that allow for greater, greater flexibility, humility, while also being completely committed to um, living our lives according to a, a system that we call Mormonism, a restoration that comes through Joseph Smith, however imperfectly, um, that, uh, that is every bit as meaningful as any other way to live your life, and therefore we can call true. I'm so honored you would come on Mormon Stories, Patrick. Thank so thank you for being willing to be here today. It means a lot. And I think you're a, a good man. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate thanks, all Patrick. you guys. And sorry Just to have to leave Mormon early. Mormon Matters, too. So thanks for coming. <laughs> and, on Mormon yeah. and Mormon Matters. And Mormon Matters. All right. Sorry to have to leave <laughs> thanks, early, but, it, but I'll uh, hey, hopefully catch care. my flight. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks Patrick. Patrick. Thank, thank you. Care. See ya. Well, John, that last section with Patrick um, got to a lot of the things that I wanted to pick up on earlier when I thought we were running more out of time, and which we certainly are, but your critiques of the neopologetics as sort of redefining terms and, you know, supporting the institutional narratives and things like that. And so Brian and I, have, as, you know, philosophy of religion and theology uh, students and things like that, we you know, Brian Tuck, we, we really have a sense of what theology is as distinct from proclamation or from prophetic utterance and things like this. And even though you kind of called it like a lowering down or, a, you know, getting the expectations lower and things like that, and that seems like a loss to you, Brian and I probably, and I, I want you to do most of the speaking on this, Brian, if you're willing, that's just normal conversation within religions as the day comes along and new evidences come along and new theologies and new cultural uh, assumptions and things going on theology is always a conversation yeah i agree and you know uh theology uh like most other areas of study uh it comes in many forms has uh, inclusive definitions exclusive definitions uh, but one way to see, you know, theology is bringing uh, the claims of a tradition into, into conversation with broader currents of thought. Yeah, exactly. And to see how these things connect together both internally for, you know, the sake of coherence and consistency within a faith tradition, uh, but also the more outward facing, uh, you know, do these things uh, you know, line up with, uh, with what we observe. 
and uh, and can there be a, a, a conversation with broader cultural currents? Uh, and this, you know, if you look at the story of theology in Christianity, which is what I know most about, uh, it, it is a conversation that uh, that has a life, uh, you know, that has evolved in different cultural contexts. Different methodological approaches have been the order of the day, right? We see during, you know, uh, you know, beginning with St. Thomas Aquinas, right? Scholasticism and systematization, and then the Reformation comes along, and there's more, much more of a pastoral approach, and there's scriptural theology, narrative theology. I mean, there are all kinds of different ways yeah. in which uh, the issue can be approached, uh, but... Yeah, and, it is, and, a, and it is it a separate look, conversation. Yeah, and, and yeah. there is a loss of the power of the boldness and things like that, but it it doesn't seem to me that it's any less important um, because we do live in a world in which, you know, we're surrounded by assumptions and, and new fields of study and conversations and things like that. So, so John, I'm totally in sympathy, in sympathy with, um, you know, what, le what leads to, you know, you're talking about, we're bringing down the expectations, but I don't know that there's sometimes I catch in your talking about this neo apologetics that you're also saying, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, it's like they are going around there supporting the institutional narrative in other words it's like their their goal in some it, i mean i don't know if you mean it that way but the way it sometimes comes across is you're saying the goal of the bushmans or the Givenses or the you know adam miller and, and patrick is to support the institutional narrative whereas i kind of just see it as man they're just having conversations with what's going on in their fields of study and, and in the yeah. church and all that so no, i appreciate that maybe i'll maybe i'll answer that a little bit so at the end of the day and again i'm i have a phd but it's in clinical and counseling psychology it's not in theology it's not in religious studies um so i don't pretend to be an expert so I, i'm going to speak as just a common observer of mormonism right now and just say that what I, uh, going back to what I said to Patrick, um, we have, you know, we have the historical narrative that the church has taught. Now, of course, they've taught, lot, taught lots of narratives, but we have a point where Richard Bushman says, you know, the prevailing narrative is not true or whatever he said. But it, it basically references this idea that the church taught a certain narrative for a long time that now is not really sustainable. Um, and, and so a lot of us were raised with that narrative. It's why we believed it's what we based our beliefs upon. And then we make all these incredibly big decisions, how much money we give away, who we marry, when we marry, how many kids we have, what our careers are, how we spend our time. The stakes are phenomenally high mm -hmm. <laughs> for this core question of, is the church really what it claims to be? Now, there's, there's a lot of people who are going to remain Mormon just for practical reasons. It, it makes me feel good. It, it's a great community. It's where I can develop my spiritual sense. And I'm, I don't believe that's, I believe those are all valid paths. But at its core, and this is somewhere where I disagreed with Lloyd in the book, at the core, Mormonism, the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith's first vision story, it all begins with, historical claims that something did or didn't happen on the earth in a corporeal sense. And so, um, and then from there, the fun, you know, DNC, the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith himself, every general conference talk ever given sets up this idea that this is God's one true church with exclusive authority and only Mormon ordinances count in heaven. And, you know, your family won't be together in the afterlife if they're not sealed in a Mormon ceiling. The stakes are just super high, and everything is framed in a very literalistic, orthodox way. And so, if that's all true, we should believe it. But if it's not true, or if it's not as the church claims, then for many, many people, they don't want to be, they don't want to have anything to do with it. But then there's so many people that don't even know the basic problems with the church's founding narrative. So here's my answer to your question, Dan. 
when Patrick Mason or Richard Bushman or Terrell and Fiona Givens go around the, the church, they're not just having interesting theological discussions. What I see them as doing is basically saying, stay in the boat, keep believing in the church, keep serving in the church, keep paying your tithing, keep viewing the prophets and the apostles as inspired men of God. That's what I see them functionally doing in their books, in their retreats, in their workshops, in their firesides. And so in that sense... But you also probably see that they actually believe those things. They're not doing it for this reason. No, that's fine. That's they, fine. You know, but in other but words, the, they, they've made... They, they've, they've taken... Uh, the life journey uh, that all of us have to do. You know, we grow up with a certain view about our parents and we have to, you know, learn uh, through hard things that they're yes. a little no, bit no. less than yes. you know, but, but, what we thought we were. Same thing with our national narratives and things like this. They've done these things yes. and yet still believe those things uh, about, you know, an inspiration, but they may, they may be on the front lines of saying, we've got to get rid of this infallibility cr- that's been creeping in when it comes to prophets and things like this. We have to, yes, we have to understand no. that revelation is always a two, two way dynamic. Dan, no, I, 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 go ahead, Brian. I, I was going to say, I've got a, I've got a hard stop. I've got to admit okay. to an exam. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So okay. If, if I, can I just say one? Yeah, yeah please. There, please there jump so in many and then fun we can decide whether we, could, on. Yeah. we could talk about uh, here. Uh, but, you know, I think John, you're, you're, point is fair uh, about uh, the expectations, right, and the recalibration of expectations uh, that, are, that are currently underway. I think in Mormonism, there is a very, very strong common sense oriented uh, sensibility, right, a kind of taste for something either being true or historical or not being true, and that, you know, is it's part of the American context, but it's, it's especially Mormon. Uh, and, and yet in the face of very difficult empirical facts that can no longer be denied or deflected or explained away. Uh, I think there has been a, a step back into more of a, uh, a plausibility structure where yes. what you call neo apologetics is saying okay in light of right some of these hard conversations and the right the hard facts of of science and and other areas of study can a person recalibrate reorient the way in which they relate to the faith tradition so that they don't so that they don't remain as brittle to use the word patrick said right so they can move from the brittle to the supple and are there ways of talking about Mormonism that are more uh, narrative and nuanced and less tied to right straightforward empirical claims? And I think that you know the conference at Utah State that you reference is one evidence is is evidence of one way of talking about it that way. But I think you're right that there is a price to be paid for that move, and that's something that the LDS community needs to continue to, to talk about, you know, uh, very straightforwardly, right? We need to be able to reflect on what are the implications of, uh, you know, uh, of, of nuancing the historicity of the Book of Mormon or the translation process, right? Or the, you know, the origins uh, of the church. Uh, so I, I, I see this as, you know, the, some new features are coming on to the ship in terms of what what the community needs to deal with. And I think, as Patrick mentioned, that the institutional church is uh, responding uh, positively and in beneficial ways to that. But I share Patrick's uh, view that uh, much more could be done and should be done and, and much more could be done on the part of church leadership to, you know, to be candid uh, and uh, and straightforward about you know what kinds of shifts are taking place. So with yeah. that said, I you got Brian, it. Brian, I you are that. also a real credit to to this tradition, and I'm just so honored that you would come on Mormon Stories and Mormon Matters. 
<laughs> so it's it's been a delight having you on. Thank you for thank you for me. the invitation. Yeah, I hope, hey, I hope you'll come back. Appreciate you, brother. All right, take care, man. See ya. Bye bye. All right, so, John. So, yeah. so Dan, so what do you want to do? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've got about I've got about ten minutes more. Yeah, so, and that's um, fine. And and I uh, that's not a problem because I want this to be a bit of a series. I want us to. Okay continue this dialogue, maybe bring Lloyd on, maybe. Yeah, I want to bring Lloyd and Fiona and uh, Julie Smith. And yeah, Lloyd that'd be Bob. great. Okay. Let me, let me just try and succinctly communicate my, my concern with neo-apologetics. It's that we were all sold a certain narrative that was fundamental to our participation. And we were sold the narrative by the church. And this is still in many ways the prevailing narrative that, that comes out of the lips of apostles and prophets in general conference, that the church is true, that prophets speak with God directly, that this is the one true church, that the Book of Mormon's historical. These are all, this is all sort of a classic Orthodox Mormon narrative 1.0. And do you believe that the people who are quote unquote selling it don't believe this? No, I do. That, that, that I'm trying to tell you my okay, concern so, with it. Let okay. me tell you my concern with it. So that's the narrative. Okay. Okay. Now we've, now, we had in the in the in the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and two thousands, anyone who spoke up against that narrative, you know, was either marginalized or browbeat or excommunicated. And so we've got Juanita Brooks who was browbeat. We've got Sterling McMurrin. We've got Leonard Arrington, Lowell Benyon, uh, the September six. Um, you know, you you know better than I do the long list of people. They sure. just tried to say, hey, there are problems with this narrative. And the church beat the crap out of them, right? And knocked them down. Now, sure. because now because the internet, now because the internet has made it so the church can't be coercive and use, you know, improper authority and, and even abuse to shut down that conversation and intimidate people, right? Now you've got now you've got the cat out of the bag. And so instead of the church saying, hey, we're really sorry we did this to people. We're sorry that we sold you an untrue and unsustainable narrative. We take accountability for that. We take accountability for all the people that we have abused and shut up and excommunicated for who were just speaking truths and who were just speaking to the evidence. Instead, what we have is the church in a subtle, non-direct way, allowing you know, apologists, whether it's the old school apologists like Midgley and, and, and Peterson or the new style apologists to try and make it okay to try and take us to a new place while still preserving the old narrative without taking any responsibility and then letting these other people sort of unofficially try and, and help us square the circle or make sense of it all or stay in the church. And in some sense, what that does is it puts good people like Mason and Gibbons and Bushman that mean well and that are doing it voluntarily, they're in a sense carrying water for, for leaders that have now questionable moral authority. They're now um, unofficially trying to explain the un unexplainable. And in a sense, they're propping up the authority and the power of a regime that that some would say has bankrupt moral authority and and has ban bankrupt scientific authority and so it's a real mess that i don't mm -hmm. i don't want to paint anyone as an enemy no it's a tough moment for sure i'm just saying that the church isn't taking responsibility for all the things it's done wrong nor is it taking responsibility sufficiently for the fact that the narrative that we've all been sold is now sort of acknowledged by thoughtful people to be bankrupt. And instead they're trying to do this long game, slowly leak out the essays, slowly do these sort of private workshops and seminars um, and hope that none of us are gonna notice that in many sense, uh, some serious abuses and some seriously grievous injustices have been performed on a lot of people. Yeah. Oh. No, uh, what you say, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if we were to take it sentence by sentence, I would, you know, challenge a lot of the extreme language, you know, bankrupt and this and those, you know, kinds of things and the totalies and all that sort of stuff. But this is certainly a, a difficult moment. 
um, for that. And I can see all your arguments there that, that you made and that's, that's how it would feel. Um, you know, as somebody who, who sits in the pews and has a sense of, you know, I have lots of friends who are in leadership positions within the wards and stakes and various things. And I, and I see the lived Mormonism of day to day. And I know that the general church leaders have a concern for the folks for whom I see wonderful people in my wards. I mean, you know, never would deny this thing. Mormonism is working for them. So for them to say, this is our one major focus, to right these wrongs, to own up to all these things, you're right. I cry, I cry for, you know, apologies. I cry, I cry for acknowledgement and things like that too. But I, I don't sit there and say, the church should make this priority number one. I know that there are certain voices within the church that, that do it. There are certain voices within the church that actually led to a lot of these abuses. You know, we know that, you know, Marky e. Peterson and Boyd P P Packer and others were the driving forces in some of these difficult things. And, you know, the, the you know, Lowell Benyon fell out of favor, you know, Leonard Ehring fell out of favor with just certain personalities. And so whenever you talk the church, I always kind of got to say it's strong personalities who happen to have risen to positions of importance. And generally, like we've talked about before, when a, when a prophet's uh, less strong and able to sort of keep the whole uh, thing together, the, the mice play sort of thing and the personalities assert. So I, I don't want to minimize anything that you're saying. I just want to say, you know, they have to have other things on their mind. I, I you know, it's like this egomaniac thing. It always like, what, what would I say if I were a general authority? You know, when I had my moment up there or what would my priorities be or something like that? Not that I, I aspire to that or anything, but a lot of it is though I'm in sympathy with all these things, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the wrong things, but I wouldn't necessarily just go straight after the repairs as quickly as you know, you would like. Sure. Well, I, I think what will be really fun in our series is to discuss and to go into depth more about all these issues and and what's practical and what's not practical, what's reasonable to expect, what's not, yeah. to talk about utility versus validity. Right. I think those are all really credible things. I think, I think I just wanted to sort of, I, I on the one hand, I think neo-apologetics is this beautiful step forward. I, I think Bushman and Gibbons and and Mason and, and others are even Brian Birch and you, I mean, Gina Colvin, some of the most beautiful, thoughtful, sensitive, wise people I've ever met. And I've got, you know, if this is apologetics, I've gone from loathing apologetics to like loving the people involved in apologetics. Right. If, if that's where we've come. So on the one hand, I'm thrilled. We I'm all hear that. thrilled. I'm thrilled with the progress. On the other hand, um, I think there's some really important ethical, moral questions about what the church should and shouldn't be responsible for, the pace of change, um, and then the extent to which it's appropriate for other people uh, to, to be carrying water for or, or excusing or yeah. apologizing for the church's behavior over time. And then there's just the question of, do does neo apologetics does nuance Mormonism not only is it compelling but does it stand up to sufficient scrutiny because because I would say the scientific I would say my my review of the evidence against his, historical Mormonism is that the Book of Mormon the Book of Abraham has has zero if not negative scientific credibility that's my view sure. i'm not saying that's true and then i would say that joseph smith whether it's his polygamy his polyandry the denials the bank fraud the the claims of translation that that, that weren't historical that weren't authentic joseph's moral um credibility for me borders on if not bankrupt negative credibility and then you could take that to modern apostles and prophets that what that they fought the civil rights movement, that they fought the ERA, yes. that they fought LGBT rights, that they uh, fought safe sex attraction. Yeah. You could you could argue that they're also morally bankrupt in the sense that they're 30 years behind any significant social change 
um, uh, and only change when forced, and they don't own up to all their inadequacies and failures. And so I'm looking forward to a series where we can talk about all that, because I think that's where the heart and the meat of, of what we're talking about sort of lies. Yeah, and I, I'm glad to keep going with you. And uh, let me, let me, the one thing I wanted to break in with a lot, and, and again, I, you, you spoke well of these positions. And again, your heart was very clear that it's, it's not, uh, it's not personal, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a real struggle and you're giving voice to lots of people. So I, I know that. Um, the piece that's been missing, and maybe if we do bring Lloyd on, um, perhaps more than anybody else in that book, he did give voice to, you know, truth, history, and things like that, and, and that, re- that these are valid, or, or these are the main, most valid ways to approach religion and to judge religion. You know, as more of a mystical person myself, as more of somebody who, you know, felt rescued by the power of God, you know, who, who took seriously these scriptures and said, man, maybe this God exists and could still love me after being such an a-hole for, you know, and, and, you know, making such a mess of things or something like that. Maybe I can go from, you know, zero to hero again and, you know, finding out for myself, you know, what God thought of me within a Mormon context, that, that informs everything for me. And as I've continued on a, 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 a path of continued engagement with what I believe is spiritual things. I don't, you know, it's just, or it's just quieting the brain for enough time for me to get into that space where there's a flow of energy and ideas and thoughts that come to me that, that feel as real as anything else. You know, they're not just emotional. They're not just uh, things that I can explain the same way I win when I listen to music or when I walk in nature. There, there's a reality at the base of my life that I'm kind of living out of. And there's, a, you know, Mormonism's deep song, its sense of the plan of salvation, the sense of God who, you know, works with other eternal beings, who wants peers and not subjects. And there's just so many wonderful things in Mormonism that appeal to me at that spiritual level that these other things, you know, you know we, haven't, we, haven't got, we haven't got to them. You know, religion in many ways for me is more like art than science. You know, it's, it's what's its ability to move you. And, uh, and there's just a power that kind of misses when we're always talking about this or that historic totally. or something. So I hope we'll get into that. So I hope we have, a- and I love, I love that every couple of years you and I come back and yeah. have, have yeah, re-engaged in this conversation yeah. and I'm looking forward to it. And yeah. Dan, I, I still very much feel the same way you do. Uh, if, if I could have remained in the church, if they would have let me, I, I think I would potentially still be a member, although the November, yeah, the November uh, policy w- w- could have kicked me out, but and I'm reeling from D- Elder Oaks just sure. a couple of days ago. I mean, this is yeah. it's, got, it's got me down. It's like, oh man, uh, it's going to be later rather than sooner <laughs> that things might change, and obviously they will change because it's uh, you know it's arguing out of the wrong position. Yeah, yeah, and to me, a, a, a witnessed position from everything in my heart and my soul and my experiences with the God who I feel like I've met and what God's priorities are, you know? Yeah. I, I love, I love that. And, um, what it has to, you know, you know, Heath Hendrickson made the point that people love Scientology. People love Judaism. They love Islam. There are lots of religious traditions that people either can raise good kids in or have a good community or can find Mm -hmm. spiritual value. Mm -hmm. But, but how do we square that with, um, with the church's bold claim that it is the one true church. Yeah. Um, so lots of, lots of fun yeah. to talk about, okay. Dan. Well, I, can't, make some plans. I can't thank you enough for, for arranging that Patrick and um, Brian would come on our, our mutual shows yeah. because they're, they're thoughtful guys. And uh, I, I just really appreciate that okay. you were able to bring them on. And I love Mormon Matters and what you do. Thanks. And I'm grateful that you are, are still – are still pushing the pushing the rock forward. <laughs> Thanks, man. Come to the workshop if you can a week from uh, Friday, and uh, go to John's uh, one day thing at the end of the month. What day was it again? The end of. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll have something. to look, but yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> anyway, John yeah. has once a month something or other to it, but uh, it's great, and we will see you again. 
real soon. All right. Dan, thanks, thanks for joining us. And all those who join us on Facebook Live, we really appreciate your comments yeah. and questions. We'll be getting to them over yeah. the time in the series. So there's many I'll take questions a, I'll, I'll take a strong or look. comments that are there. We will incorporate these into our future discussions. So let's Sounds do it. Great. Thanks. Take care, guys. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good take night. care. Or good day. <laughs> all right.